Peace be with you, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our program, Jesus Via Mary, brought to you by Mary's Littlest Children. Remember that the quickest, surest, best way to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is through Mary, His Mother. She is our Mother also, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. Now let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession, was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word Incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency hear and answer them. Amen. We have a really good program for you today, brothers and sisters. We're going to talk about the presence of God, the presence of God in us, and us being in the presence of God. Recently, at the Vatican, on March 2nd of 2014, on a rainy day, Pope Francis, in his Angelus message, focused on the importance of seeking God above all else, especially earthly goods. He said, A heart occupied by the desire to possess is full of this desire to possess things, but empty of God. In a heart possessed by riches, there is not much space for faith. Everything is occupied by riches. There is no place for faith. Instead, one should allow God his rightful place, and that is first place. How do we put God first? We may try living in the presence of God. I'm going to share with you now from the writings of Father John Hardin, a Jesuit priest whose cause is being considered. And this was obtained from the Real Presence Organization, Foundation, that promotes all of Father Hardin's writings. And we have done this with their permission. I'll be quoting excerpts from Father Hardin, and I'll be inserting my little comments here and there, but most of it is from Father John Hardin. Living in the presence of God, Father says, there is no single subject in spiritual literature that is more highly recommended or insisted upon as more indispensable than the spirit of recollection or, we might say, living in God's presence. There's no question about its fundamental role. The important thing is, how do we grow or develop in this living in God's presence? Whatever the spiritual life is, it is practice, practice, and more practice. Presence in, itself, in and of itself describes a relationship between people. Now, is God with us? Well, yes, God must sustain us, so surely we must be present to him. He's always present to us by his infinity also, or as I prefer to say, and this is Father John Harden's words, physically, because the reality of God is always affecting or influencing us. Admitting that God is always present to us physically, is he always present to us spiritually? It is the spiritual presence of God that is the subject of this meditation. What does it mean to live in God's presence in this spiritual sense, unless we first make up our minds to take time out to think about God? And nobody, not even God, will make up our minds for us. 
we have to do that ourselves. If then we wish to cultivate living in the presence of God, we must set our minds to think about God. We must place him before the eyes of our mind. And this God will not force upon us because of our free will. We must look at him with the power of our mental reflection, enlightened by faith. There's all the difference in the world between a person being here and our seeing that person. And more still is there even a difference between seeing and looking at the person. We must first look at God with that faculty whose principal purpose is to see God. We must then see him with that strange power we have of recalling people we want to think about. One of the privileges we have is that if we want to, we will. If we don't want to, we won't. It's the power we have over these minds of ours to direct them to attend to whom we wish to think about, and if we want to, to whom we wish to forget. Some people have the ability to turn their thoughts easily and almost instinctively towards God, and others find it not so easy. The essence of the contemplative life is not great facility in turning towards God. That's not what makes a contemplative. What does make a contemplative is turning one's mind towards God whether it's easy or not. And this is the basis of everything else. Of course, it de demands some effort, especially effort to stop thinking about other things such as wealth, power, prestige. But we must take every oc occasion to use or if need be create situations which then become occasions for being thought full of God, where our thoughts are full of God. What we have to convince ourselves of is that we have the power of turning our minds to what we want. The creating of occasions to become full of thoughts of God is the fundamental principle operative in spiritual reading. What's the difference between spiritual reading and that which is not spiritual. The nature of spiritual reading ought to be such that it reminds us of God. This is also the purpose of sacred images, pictures, statues, and crucifixes. This is the purpose of liturgical ritual and of religious symbolism. Moreover, it's the fundamental reason in God's providence for external gestures, such as words, posture, position in times of prayer, and is the whole purpose for creating such occasions, that we should be surrounded, literally immersed, in religious symbols which will remind us of God. This is so basic that if we wish to foster living in God's presence, we must make sure that He first comes to our attention outside of the mind in order that He will enter inside the mind. While it's possible to think of God without external reminders, it becomes increasingly difficult. Clearly, just thinking about God is not yet living in God's presence in the way in which we know we should as Christians. God must also, and especially, be in our wills. Here we have Christ's own formula for cultivating this presence of God. At the Last Supper, among other things, he said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, meaning he will do my will. And my Father will love him, and we shall come to him and make our home with him. The if is up to us, always, of course, with God's grace. The and, in this case, is up to God. We take care of the if, and he will take care of the and. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we shall come to him and make our home with him. In this passage from Christ's homily at the Last Supper is the perfect method for living in God's presence with our wills, with the assured guarantee of his then responsive dwelling in our hearts. It means simply and unequivocally that we try as far as possible always to say yes to God's will in our lives. 
how hard this is to put into practice. When we are tired and there is work to be done, what do we do? We must do it. When we are worried and uncertain about the outcome, we may have tried it before and failed, but we are sure it is God's will, so we do it. At times we cannot understand why something happened to us or those we love, but we must say, Thy will be done. Every time we unite ourselves in will to resign ourselves to the will of God, where the yes may be very reluctant, or every time we carry into effect God's will by doing it, we are living in His presence by that strongest of all presences, the union of love, where both lover and beloved have the same will. In this case, He becomes ours. No wonder Christ promises those who keep His word that the Father would love Him, and we, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, shall come to Him and make our home with Him. When are you at home? When you belong, when you feel you belong. So too with God. If we can use human language, He is made to feel He belongs. When you are taken for granted, you can relax, you're home. We touch then on the heart of our subject when we say this, God will do his part. He will make his home with us. Now the trouble is, we expect something for nothing. So we read books of St. John of the Cross, of St. Paul of the Cross, of St. Teresa of Avila, of Ignatius, of Margaret Mary, and we almost envy the consolations they experienced, the intimacy with God, which they evidently possessed. St. Margaret Mary spent seven or more hours in chapel, lost in ecstasy before the Eucharist. Well, God is a hard bargainer. Of course He will give us His intimacy. We know enough about the spiritual life to know that the subjective or psychological awareness of God's presence is not necessarily a sign of high sanctity. Nevertheless, the deep sense of intimacy of God's indwelling is not something we can acquire cheaply. These are costly graces. If we wish to experience them, we have to carry the cross. If we do this, He will do His part. We give Him our wills, and He gives us the intimacy of His presence, as only God making His home in our souls can bring about. Living in God's presence practically, is there some practical rule for growing in the presence of God? How do we do it? We make process, progress living in the presence of God, the better we learn to live less and less in the presence of self. There are all kinds of ways you can divide the human race, the men and the women, the rich and the poor, the literate and the illiterate, the Christian and the non-Christian. We can also divide the world into two parts. Those who spend most of their time living in the presence of self and those who try, as far as possible, to live in the presence of God. We hear much about the function of grace as given to us by God in order to carry out His will. That is undoubtedly one of the purposes of grace. But the role of grace is not only that we might do God's will, but that we might enjoy doing it by sensing down deep into the recesses of our souls that he is with us this sense of God being with us is his gift on one condition that we try to be with him living then in God's presence is the joy he gives us in this life as a foretaste of the joys in store for us when all effort and struggle will cease and only peace and beatitude will be had. You see, heaven is living in God's presence, where we don't have to work at it anymore. We're going to switch now a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, from the spiritual presence of Christ to the real presence of Christ. And again, we'll be quoting from Father Harden, Father John Harden, And all of the information that we're using tonight can be found at the website therealpresence.org.
There's also a lot of other information, a wealth of information. You should check out the website. You'll be very, very surprised. Father Hardin writes, Except for Easter Sunday, we would not have the Holy Eucharist today. Why not? Because the Holy Eucharist is the risen Savior who is now on earth in the real presence. He is now offering himself daily in the sacrifice of the Mass, and he is now giving himself to us in Holy Communion. On Holy Thursday night, Jesus did three things. He changed the common elements of bread and wine into his own living body and blood. He offered his human life to his Heavenly Father to be accomplished on Calvary when he would bleed to death in order to restore eternal life to a fallen human family. He gave the disciples his flesh to eat and his blood to drink in order to sustain those in his grace and raise them up on the last day. Then Jesus did one more thing. He ordained his apostles to the priesthood and thus gave them and their successors the power to continue doing what he had done until the end of time. At the Last Supper, when Jesus pronounced the words, This is my body, this is the chalice of my blood, he held himself in his own hands. But the human nature he then possessed was a mortal humanity. Hours later on Good Friday he died on the cross, and before sundown his dead body was buried in the grave. On the third day he rose from the dead in a glorified body that was immortal and would never die again. Consequently, the Jesus present in the Eucharist today is the victorious Christ who conquered death and who is in our midst pouring out his grace. Like him we are to die, but like him we are to rise on the last day. Our one condition that we believe in him and by believing may follow him now in suffering so that we may join him in a glorious eternity. Every time Mass is offered, Jesus is giving himself to his Heavenly Father. He can no longer die, but with his human will, he can continue surrendering his human life for our salvation. He physically died only once, and thus merited our redemption. In the Mass, he mystically dies every time the Holy Sacrifice is celebrated, and through the Mass confers the graces we so desperately need to remain faithful to his name. Holy Mass is therefore both a sacrifice and a sacrament. It is a sacrifice because Christ really surrenders himself and us along with him to the Eternal Father. It is a sacrament because from the Mass the whole human race receives the strength it needs to give up its own selfish will to the demanding and loving will of God. The capstone of the Holy Eucharist is Holy Communion, whose very name tells us what it can do for a soul who receives her Lord with loving charity and makes him or her holy. If the perfection of love is unity, the reception of divine love become man gives us the light and strength we need to be and remain united with Jesus, no matter how heavy the price may be. Except for Holy Communion, we could not remain firm in our loyalty to Jesus Christ. We could not remain patient under trial. We could not remain humble under human praise. We could not remain clear in our vision that sees everything here on earth as only a means to our final destiny. In her Dialogue on Prayer, St. Catherine of Siena shares this observation of Christ about Holy Communion, 
And these are the words of Jesus. By receiving this sacrament, Jesus said, The soul dwells in me, and I in her, as the fish in the sea, and the sea in the fish. Thus do I dwell in the soul, and the soul in me, the sea of peace. There is nothing more that we desire than peace. Very well. The secret is to accept in our bodies the Prince of Peace, and then cooperate with the graces we receive. We'll be talking more next week about the true presence of God in the Eucharist, brothers and sisters. But for now, first of all, I want to remind you about the devotional book entitled Flame of Love. You can get a free copy of this book by going online and typing in flameoflove.us. And the people at the foundation who are handling this devotion for the entire United States, after you fill in your name and address, they will mail you a free book with no obligation. Now, we're not affiliated with the foundation, but we definitely believe in the devotion. We have a great deal of respect for the people at the foundation, so we recommend it highly to you. Go online, flameoflove.us, fill in your name and address, and you'll receive a free book. You may recall that last week we talked about Mary, and one of the major portions of that program had to do with her prayer entitled The Magnificat when she visited her cousin Elizabeth. Now I'm going to share with you some words from St. Bede the Venerable about a homily that he touched on regarding the Magnificat. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. With these words, Mary first acknowledges the special gifts she has been given. Then she recalls God's universal favors bestowed unceasingly on the human race. When a man devotes all his thoughts to the praise and service of the Lord, he proclaims God's greatness. His observance of God's commands, moreover, show that he has God's power and greatness always at heart. His spirit rejoices in God his Savior and delights in the mere recollection of his Creator, who gives him hope for eternal salvation. These words are often for all God's creations, but especially for the Mother of God. She alone was chosen, and she burned with spiritual love for the Son she so joyously conceived. Above all other saints, she alone could truly rejoice in Jesus, her Savior, for she knew that He, who was the source of eternal salvation, would be born in time in her body, in one person, both her own Son and her Lord. For the Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. Mary attributes nothing to her own merits. She refers all her greatness to the gift of the one whose essence is power and whose nature is greatness. For he fills with greatness and strength the small and the weak who believe in him. She did well to add, and holy is his name, to warn those who heard and indeed all who would receive his words that they must believe and call upon his name. For they too could share in everlasting holiness and true salvation, according to the words of the prophet. And it will come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the name she spoke of earlier, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Therefore, it is an excellent and fruitful custom of Holy Church that we should sing Mary's hymn at the time of evening prayer. By meditating upon the Incarnation, our devotion is kindled, and by remembering the example of God's Mother, we are encouraged to lead a life of virtue. Such virtues are best achieved in the evening. We are weary after the day's work and worn out by our distractions. The time for rest is near, and our minds are ready for contemplation. And now, my friends, here's an excerpt from a sermon by St. Anselm 
about the Blessed Virgin. Lady, full and overflowing with grace, all creation received new life from your abundance. Virgin blessed above all creatures, through your blessing all creation is blessed, not only creation from its creator, but the creator himself has been blessed by creation. To Mary God gave his only begotten Son, whom he loved as himself. Through Mary God made himself a son, not different but the same, by nature Son of God and Son of Mary. The whole universe was created by God, and God was born of Mary. God created all things, and Mary gave birth to God. The God who made all things gave himself form through Mary, and thus he made his own creation. He who could create all things from nothing would not remake his ruined creation without Mary. God then is the father of the created world, and Mary the mother of the recreated world. God is the father by whom all things were given life, and Mary the mother through whom all things were given new life. For God begot the Son, through whom all things were made, and Mary gave birth to him as the Savior of the world. Without God's Son nothing could exist. Without Mary's Son nothing could be redeemed. Truly the Lord is with you, to whom the Lord granted that all nature should owe as much to you as to himself. Thank you, Mother Mary, for being our mother and for being with us today, this afternoon, and guiding us. Let's say a little prayer, brothers and sisters. You can join in by just absorbing what I say in your heart and in your mind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope that you will join us again next week, brothers and sisters. We have a lot more really good information for you. And as we get further into Lent, we'll be talking about the passion of our Lord and how much he suffered out of love for us in order to redeem us, in order to take all of our sins upon himself and carry them so that the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane and throughout the Passion would punish Jesus by the suffering he sent, the suffering that he willed upon Jesus, so that we would not have to suffer that same outcome. Now we must go to Jesus so that he can forgive us, and he does so willingly. Every time we go to confession and the priest says, I absolve you from your sins, we are free of the sins that we committed. Join us next time. We want to be with you. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, Pray for us who have recourse to thee. Take care now, brothers and sisters. God bless.